I'm Chris Chambers, Security and Emergency Management Manager at Tampa Electric and the Chair of Tampa Bay's Chambers Military Advisory Committee. Thank you all for joining us tonight for our third webinar in the Operation Partnership Transition Tampa Bay series. Normally, this event is hosted as a one-day career intensive forum in person. However, to ensure the health and safety of all, we have adapted the content to be hosted over a series of webinars. Although we wish you could have had these interactions in person, we appreciate your commitment to invest in yourself during your transition and joining us this evening. We don't expect today's webinar to cover everything regarding your transition, but we want you to walk away with confidence in your decision to transition from the military into the civilian business community. Our programming would not be possible without the support of our sponsor, USAA. Joining us this evening to provide remarks on behalf of them is Kay Sports, Executive Director, Human Resources, Regional Operations. Thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you tonight again to the third iteration of our Operation Partnership uh, Project Transition. Tonight, once again, you're going to get some information that will help you with your transition. And USA, we are so very pleased to sponsor this and bring this to you. The, the two topics tonight, exploring your career and uh, financial planning, understanding, and getting smarter about your money are near and dear to our heart here at USA. We definitely want you to be prepared as you transition. We want you to land in a beautiful landing spot. We want you to be highly successful. So that's why we're here. We're glad to bring it to you tonight. So thanks so much and, and, and enjoy the presentations. Thank you, Kay. We appreciate USA's support of the Chambers Military Program. Before we get started with our first session, I want to encourage you to ask your questions during our sessions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer these live throughout the program as time permits. Our first speaker tonight is Mike Flyshower, Vice President with Regions Bank Private Wealth Management Group. Mike is a certified financial planner and certified public accountant. He has been in the financial services industry for 22 years. Mike is a Navy veteran and when he transitioned into civilian life, began working and attending college using his GI Bill benefits. Mike is going to share the benefits of a personal financial plan to help you make educated financial decisions and to alleviate unnecessary financial stress whenever possible. Mike, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Mike, I think you're still muted. There How's that? Try that one more time. I can hear you now. Thank you, Mike. Chris, thank you, sir, for that introduction. And Kay, thank you as well as for the sponsorship of USAA to make this happen with the Tampa Chamber. Again, uh, my name is Mike Fleischauer, and like you, um, maybe you haven't gotten there quite yet, but you're thinking and looking at transitioning into the civilian world. And I hope that uh, some of my speaking with you tonight can be a benefit, at least help you to be uh, engaged with the decision as we are in these unusual times. Um, you couldn't have picked a better time in, in life, right, to consider transitioning out of your uh, career into something that is maybe known or maybe temporarily changed or uh, maybe you're not sure exactly where you're going with this. And that's the point of the session is financial planning is certainly not the most exciting topic in the world when you really think about it, but it does empower you to make decisions and to forecast and be prepared for a very uncertain time such as this or if uh, something were to occur later in life. I am going to go through two case studies and I've input both of those scenarios. And I know everybody is at different points in their military career, whether you've done 20 years more or whether you've done six or eight. Uh, but what I am going to share in both instances is a single individual as an E7 Chief Master Sergeant. Um, and then I'm going to uh, use a couple, one, that is the same master sergeant, chief master sergeant rather, and they're gonna be eligible for their pension, and they're married, and where's their life going? And we'll talk about GI bills and future jobs and a little bit of everything, but the critical takeaway as I go through these things is to show and demonstrate the software's capabilities. And your situation is very unique to you, so if I don't cover something that is applicable to you, Again, the point is to just illustrate the uh, intellectual property that we have here. And uh, you may have a financial advisor, 
you may need one for the first time in your life right now. Um, if, if it's ever a situation where I could be of assistance to, of course, I offer that service. Uh, but again, you might have somebody, or if you're looking for somebody, uh, the software that I'm going to be using today is called eMoney. And so eMoney is the state of the art, uh, interactive, and, and I mean interactive because we can in real time share scenarios uh, with our clients of how things might be turning out or if they make a decision at a fork in the road and go in one direction or if they wanted to go into another direction, what would the likelihood and the probability? And most importantly, this really comes down to is your cash flow. So I don't want to make it sound too technical. Um, and again, financial planning isn't always somebody's cup of tea. Um, but for me, it became a career. And so I'll digress for just a second and, and maybe uh, share this with you. And uh, that was me a long, long time ago as a squid uh, in boot camp. And uh, here I am now, in addition to talking to you. Uh, this is a little bit about my uh, background and bio. But the point of me sharing this with you is, again, I had to transition from military life into what first became for me uh, working and, and going to school part time. But I'll have to tell you, a lot has changed, as you probably very well know. And if you don't, again, this is something I can help you to get information on. It's readily available online. But the post 9-11 GI Bill is um, a wonderful educational option. And frankly, for some of you, it might be the difference if you haven't considered using it. Uh, maybe you ought to because some of the financial benefit that stems from it not only can propel you to the next part of your life, but maybe even financially keep you in the game when some of the plans that you may have had in the near future have all of a sudden changed because of where we're at today. So um, with that said, I'm going to migrate to my software here and see if this just pulls up. Might need. Hey Mike, we can't see your screen. So I just okay. wanted to tell you before we get too far. <laughs> yeah, so um, am I in control at this point as the presenter? Should. There should be a, a button at the bottom that says share screen. Share screen, okay, that might be helpful. All right, so I'll share this real quick. Um, that was me a long, long time ago. I don't know if I'm any, any better looking now, but I, I do know that uh, I'm a lot smarter. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that'll be a benefit to you today. And what I'm trying to do is the moment as I stumble is get back to here and share. Okay. All right. So can you see that, Katie? Yes, you're good. Okay, great. Well, let's jump into a financial planning situation here. And all the data has been input but the point of me sharing this with you is it might specifically apply to you, I'm not sure, uh, but it certainly will again tell you what options you might have in the marketplace as financial decisions come upon you. So um, apology for the, for the bad name, but GI Jane is 38 years old. She joined the military right out of high school, did 20 years, uh, she's single, we're gonna look at retirement, but hey, we're trying to live in the moment, right? Most of us, it's a, it's a great exercise to see if I'll be able to retire at whatever uh, amount that I would love to live off of, but you know, this is just as applicable to today, but I did wanna just mention that because uh, what we do is look at somebody's life today, uh, we look at it in the future when we use financial planning software like this, and the most important thing about this is our life is fluid, I mentioned that, and as things change, the ability to, to look at your resources or consider your options uh, is very powerful. So I hope that that's what really comes and stems from this. So uh, GI Jane would love to retire at age 65 in a perfect world. And that's what she's that's in part to look at for her. And her life expectancy is to age 90. We can extend that to whatever age she wants, to 100, uh, to 120. And she has a son name He-Man, only because if I had a son, I would name him He-Man. So uh, he's six years old, um, and that is a little bit about her personally. So let's look at her financial priorities as she's expressed them. Well, she's saving for a major purchase. In fact, she's been living in base housing and is hoping to buy her own home. So 
um, as she looks to go and start a new educational tract and a new career, she's also going to be thinking about saving for the next couple of years and put a down payment on the home for her and he man. She's also invest, interested in investment management. She's had her TSP for 20 years. It's done well for her. Uh, but she also realizes that she has options with that. You know, she could take that to an institution that uh, maybe provides some other uh, tools and resources, or she could keep it in her TSP. Um, it's really up to her, but she really needs to get her hands around, uh, hey, I'm, I'm afraid of what the market and the economy is doing right now. How is that going to affect me in the short term with my investments? And if I want to be able to retire at 65, how might that affect me later? in how I invest my money between now and then, and then maybe even after I retire. Um, when people retire, they tend to become more conservative. Um, not always, but, but more often than not. And of course, we have to deal with He-Man. Uh, He-Man's gonna go to uh, Castle Gray School University, I suppose, and we wanna factor in the cost of doing that. And as we mentioned, she's also interested in retirement planning. So what's her financial goals? Again, she'd like to retire at age 65. Uh, she'd like to have $4,000 a month after taxes, $1,000 a month at that time um, because she is single and that would be enough to sustain her. Um, and when we look at educational expenses, she's considering going to school. Um, oh, no, actually, I'm sorry. This educational expense is for her son in 2032 when he's 18. And at that time, we forecasted the annual expense to be about $22,000. I also will note that um, she expects her son to live with him until he has finished his undergrad degree. And so those are her two major goals looking forward. But again, she's more concerned with you know, what's going on in my life right now. So we have to look, of course, is, well, what do you have, right? What's there available to support your needs and in consideration to other cash flows or assets that you might accumulate to sustain you now and in the future. So she has an account at Regions Bank. Uh, that's her primary savings account and she's done pretty good in 20 years, just putting a little money away and also living during that time. And she has a checking account at USAA. Uh, that's where most of her monthly transactions float through. Uh, she has her TSP account, right? We talked about that and she needs to consider how that might need to sustain her if she doesn't walk right into this uh, career that she's expecting. In fact, what I'll share with you in a moment is she's expecting to work part-time, uh, go to college, and then at which time she will begin a new career. Uh, she does have a Lexus, right? So she still owes some money on that. That's her one liability. And if we look at her total net worth, you know, she's worth a quarter million dollars. She's still young. Uh, she's going to go to school and more than likely enter her prime income earning years yet. So let's look at what her income sources are going to be. Keep in mind, too, that the art of this, right, it's part art, part science, is that we can take whatever is specific to you and import these things and look at uh, any consideration, whether it's just in the next year or for the next 30 years or just a specific goal. Um, but right now, we're looking at everything comprehensively. So in order to do that, we need to know what your income sources are, right? So she's expecting to go get a part-time job. Uh, she's not going to transition out towards the end of the year and, you know, there's going to be the holidays and family and hopefully we get some sem semblance of real life again. But going forward, as she begins to go to college, she's going to have a part-time job and she expects to make about $18,000 a year, $1,500 a month. She's going to do it part-time. That's what she's expecting to net. And as an E7 pension, whether you're an officer, I'm sorry, I didn't put what yours might be. And if you don't have a pension, then that's something we need to consider here, right? Uh, depending on what your situation might be. Uh, but her intention is, is to you know, have that income source or part-time income source here. And as she pursues her nursing career, she is going to start attending college next year is the thought. And she expects by the time she graduates college that she'll work in a specialty field in nursing that she desires. And her beginning income will be about $65,000. And for brevity purposes today, I won't get into the layers, but if I were to click in her nursing career, I could uh, consider things such as what she's uh, going to get in raises, if that is going to be uh, something we want to consider, or uh, as it applies to a retirement plan. If she has a 401k, maybe she already knows the hospital that she's really wanting to work at, they do 3% match and she's going to do 5% and 
we can factor anything you want in all this. And so much that based on what her income projections are, we already know what her social security might be if she takes it at full retirement age. And uh, what that means is the full benefit that you would normally get uh, based on what the guidance of social security administration is currently. Um, you can take it earlier to reduce the amount or you might uh, wanna take it later in life, uh, 70, uh, is where you would get a little bit of a raise each year if you didn't need the cash flow at age 67. Um, some people might want to retire at 65 like Jane, but when we do this type of financial planning, we realize that, well, she might need to work for a couple more years if she really wants to live off what she's saying she wants to, which is what we'll get to in a moment. All right, so uh, He-Man's father is involved in his life and he also supports that child. And so another income source for Jane is she has about $1,000 a month uh, for child support that she uses to take care of her son. And then because she's gonna start college, the basic housing allowance that is available to somebody that uses the GI Bill for up to three years is uh, about just under $25,000 a year. And whether you're an E9 or a, an Officer 4 or a, a E three and you got out after, you know, four or three or four years, um, it's still the same amount that you have eligible for, for housing. And this is where I mentioned this might be critical. If you were ever considering going back to school, but you're like, oh, I'm going to go work for a year. I'm going to go travel and see the world. Wait a minute. Maybe you, <clears throat> for very good reason, uh, should consider this because it's a good income source while you're, you know, preparing and uh, moving on to the next part of your life if that's in your plans. So that's all of our income sources and what we project them to be going forward. Again, life's fluid. Things, if they change, we'll come right back in here and change them as Jane sits there and does this with us or in a WebEx environment such as this. Here's her current living expenses. She spends about $5,500 a month net, which is about $66,000 a year. And even though it's a long time away, she expects, again, to be able to live off of $4,000 a year at age 65. She pay down some debt, hopefully the house will be paid off, yet to be seen, but then, you know, things are, are better. She's going to be paying off that Lexus, and then, you know, the big expense is going to be when her son turns 18 years old, he might end up having a scholarship. Um, he might end up uh, not going to college. Maybe he started, uh, um, I don't know, PayPal too, like Elon Musk, and now he's in rocket science. Let's hope for that, right? But other than that, you know, the plan right now is that, her son is going to need some cash flow, and mom might want to support that goal. Uh, the one thing I'm going to point out now, uh, we're going to go to the married couple in just a moment, but in this situation, remember, uh, her son's going to stay at home versus in the next scenario that I'm going to show you, uh, their daughter wants to go and experience life on campus. And so even though I put in, as a matter of fact, I can go in here and you tell me what state your child wants to go to school what university, state, or private university, and it will calculate what the expenses are projected to be versus what they are now, and with the inflation that's historically happened, and it'll populate and tell you what it's going to be. Even if you just wanted to do educational planning for your child and you thought you had everything else going on, this software can work in a modular format just like that. But what I put in for both of our case studies is that their children are both gonna attend the University of South Florida. Uh, that's where I got my finished my undergrad degree and did my graduate work. So why wouldn't you, right? And it's right in our backyard, but go to school wherever your heart takes you. Now she also is wise enough to have some life insurance for her son and it's a term policy. I'll show you that in just a second, but she does have some life insurance for her son. And then uh, the software is so powerful that if I put in all those income sources I shared with you a couple minutes ago, it will simulate a 1040 tax return and tell us what your tax rates are based on as they are today. But we know the current tax rates uh, probably aren't going to be the same now in the future. And so another reason that uh, a financial plan could be a fluid thing for you, and you might integrate it into your life going forward from here based on who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. All right, so let's look at some of Jane's savings. So the only thing she's saving for right now, she's got a tough task, right? She's transitioning out of the military. She's got a son. She's going to start college. She's going to work part-time. And so maybe saving isn't the biggest opportunity for her at this point in her life. Not to say it won't be later, uh, but for now it's not. So what we have here is the ability to uh, contribute a thousand dollars a month or she's going to make it happen one way or the other because she's earmarking to put twenty-five thousand dollars down on the new home in two years. And so 
Um, that's what that money is relegated for there. I talked about protection. Uh, protection is the insurance, whether you wanted to do disability insurance because you were a professional engineer and or you were going to medical school after the military or you're a doctor now and you're going to go into private practice and your hands are your most valuable tools. I can factor in disability insurance, life insurance, uh, long-term care insurance, uh, any kind of insurance that you might want. But uh, Jane right now is satisfied with doing a term policy that costs her $600 a year to provide $500,000, a half million dollars in insurance for the benefit of her son in case something unexpectedly happened to her in her life. So um, again, let me just go back to her, her, her expenses and taxes. You know, when she's 65 years old right now until then, and assuming that she's going to have a mortgage here in a couple years, she's expecting to live off about $5,500 a month. That's pretty modest, but you know, she's just her and her son. And then by the time she's 65, she wants to be able to live off of $4,000 a month. So I'm going to do what they call uh, a Monte Carlo simulation. And I didn't get into this today for brevity, but when we talk about your TSP or any investment accounts, how are those assets invested? How much of it is in more safety, uh, bond, uh, or other fixed income instruments? And how much of it is in the stock market that's always going up and down, right? Especially lately. That's a whole nother discussion and exercise, but I just made some basic assumptions to the plan at this point. And so um, we're going to do what we call Monte Carlo simulation, and we're gonna test a thousand different outcomes in Jane's life between now and the age 65 and through her age 90 with the way that she's telling us she wants to invest now, and we use her TSP to make those investment decisions, and how she plans to invest when she does retire, because now she can't risk the market going up and down because she might need more of that money, and you know that's, that's just her personal situation. So it tests a thousand lifetimes for Jane, and it tells us what's the likelihood of success is how she described how she plans her life to be, and plans change, but if nothing were to change, how successful would she be if everything else was constant going forward as she pictures her life being on her life's canvas. So what this is gonna tell us is if I go and stress test her life a thousand times over, is that she has a, drum roll, as it catches up, she has a 98% probability of living her life as she wishes, paying for her child's education, living off of 4,000. She might then come to me and say, well, you know, 4,000 is kind of cheap. What if I want to live off of 6,000, right? And then I would put that in there. In fact, I could do it right now. I want to go to the other strategy with the other clients and I'll, I'll manipulate something on them to show how this gets affected. But you remember me telling you, and it states right here, this analysis illustrates the potential results of your financial plan using 1,000 randomly generated market returns and volatility called trial runs. And so it's just looking at your money that you have decided how to manage it. And if a thousand different uh, things occur between now and your retirement, how would that affect your plan? So um, let's go a, a layer deeper just for a moment. Uh, this is very relevant to some people, especially if you're analytical and you really want to look at the numbers. So I have all kinds of reports I could pull up, but I'm right now only going to focus on the cash flow report and just show you two quick things. Okay, so as the computer catches up to our screen here, I'm gonna to begin to scroll down. And without getting too much into it, it shows what her total inflows are from uh, basic housing allowance, her, her part-time job, uh, child support, everything, and what she's spending and over her entire lifetime. And, and you know, we can get into why these graphs look like they do, uh, but what I wanted to more importantly show you right now is, is that this shows all her income sources coming in and if she had other income sources and you know what she needs to go out and and how much she's saving we talked about she's saving twelve thousand dollars a year how that affects her negative and positive cash flow and i just want to pause there for a second because you might be in a situation where if that job that you're looking for at transition isn't going to be available immediately what am i going to do now and uh, worst case scenarios you might have to dip into some of your assets 
and and use that. Um, and you know, unfortunately, uh, but for a good reason. One time in my life, when I left corporate America and worked for myself for five years, and I bought two tax practices, I used some of my retirement plan money that I had in a 401k at the time when I left uh, my corporation that I was with for almost a decade. And I used part of that as seed money to start my business venture. And so that was a negative cash outflow to me because I wasn't making it in my personal life, right? And I maybe didn't have the option of the GI Bill, or maybe I just don't want to go to school or whatever the situation is. But this really tells us everything that you might want to know about your, your cash flow, so much so that I can even go into that specific year and show you all the sources of your income, where specifically they're coming from. And again, as the screen catches up, I'll scroll down. And if we wanted to look at where our money was coming from, well, there's our basic housing allowance for three years. Here's my part-time job income, my child support. And here's my pension. I'm always gonna have my pension. And wow, when I get to retirement, that was the best investment I ever made. Even though I did 20 years in the military and maybe I initially only wanted to do four, but look how that paid off for me for the rest of my life. And then, wow, social security is on top of that. That's the guaranteed income. And we can see where these different income sources are coming every single year. And the software can just go on and on and on. And, and I don't want to bore you too much, but I do want to jump to another case study real quick. Um, and then maybe as I'm doing that, if you're interested, if, you're not, you know, making a stake out in the back row and kind of passively listening. But if you're watching this and you have access to the chat box, um, how many people here have ever even done a financial plan and or, uh, you know, just put uh, yes or no. That kind of just gives me a, an idea based on our participation. You know, how many people have actually ever even considered something to, to this level is where I'm going with that. Not where you just walk in and somebody gives you, this is how you should invest your money. This much in bonds and this much in stocks and give me your money. I mean, real financial planning, core financial planning like this, if you're interested in, in telling us, that'd be great. So I'm going to move on to one of my other clients here that I set up for us. And this was Mr. and Mrs. Patriot. And that's going to take a second. Okay, let's go check them out. I'll go a little bit faster through this one, uh, but we're gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna massage it a little bit so it doesn't look like it's so rosy, right? And, and make a couple points there. Uh, but here's what we have for them. We have in their life, they've been married, and uh, they've been married since they were very young, over 20 years, so they have a life together. They, they own a home, I'll point that out in a moment. And they're on the same page. Whoops, let me go back here. Okay, so Mr. Patriot was not in the military. Miss Patriot was. She's 39. Okay, she's getting out after 20 years. Mr. Patriot's a little bit older than her. Um, and they both plan to retire at 65. So she might be working for another five years while he's doing whatever, hopefully a honeydew list. They're both living the age of 90. They have a daughter. She's eight years old. And uh, their financial priorities. Sometimes your priorities don't agree, right? But ultimately, we can plan for individual priorities, but uh, a marriage as well as a financial plan for that family works better when people decide together as to what's the most important thing to focus on. So um, life's been pretty good to them thus far, and their daughter's eight, you know, 10 more years, and she's going to have this college expense that we haven't prepared for yet. And so we're going to look and analyze her college savings. Uh, we need to know what to do with our money going forward. And, you know, we both want to retire at age 65, as we talked about. So here's what they have to accomplish that goal right now in any future cash flows or assets or inheritances or lottery winnings that stem from any ventures that they might go down through those paths. They have a, they have a uh, cash account. They have a savings account. They have each a qualified retirement plan. Now, uh, Mr. Patriot's retirement plan uh, has a little bit more assets. They've been married the same amount of time. Is it because of income inequality? I, I, I don't know. I hope not. Uh, maybe it's because he was more risky with his money. Uh, maybe he has a better matching plan than what the missus had. There's various reasons, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, you could be dealing with uh, different types of balances for very different reasons in so much that 
it's uh, sometimes a group decision in a marriage where the corporation that maybe one of the spouses works for, they do match a lot more. So maybe they defer a lot more income from that spouse's salary in order to get the maximum benefit of that company's plan. Um, there's a lot of reasons why any of these things could be different. So we look at life insurance. They have two different life insurance policies. And typically, uh, because uh, women live longer, uh, the insurance premiums are often lower, uh, barring any medical conditions. And so that might be why we have different cash balances in those life insurance policies. Whereas in the other case, it was a term policy. And I won't go down the bunny trail of life insurance, but some life insurance policies can act as an investment vehicle and a way for savings. And so the other reason one might have more than the other is just like with the 401k, they're invested in different things within the insurance policy. And maybe that's the first time you ever heard that. What do you mean invest in an insurance policy? It's an option and, and people do that. And sometimes that's where smart money goes. Now they also own their home. They didn't live on base. Their house is worth $330,000, uh, but they owe 250 on it. So, you know, this might instantly create a lot of options for them. They might be able to go to the bank and if, Miss Patriot getting out of the military, if that gets disrupted with her civilian career for the next one, two, three, four, whatever years, maybe they need to go to their financial institution and, and tap into that equity. I'm not suggesting you do that. Um, having no debt is better than having debt. But as I started with earlier in these case studies, what if you don't have those options, right? Um, and even though I owned a home at the time that I went and, as I mentioned, used part of my qualified plan to fund a business venture, I probably could have done a HELOC, um, but just personally, and this is where your own thoughts and predispositions towards things uh, filter in, I wasn't wanting to do a HELOC. I didn't want to tap into any of my home's equity at all whatsoever, and I went the other way, and I could make some good arguments as to why that wasn't the smartest tax thing to do either. It didn't matter. That's what I wanted to do, and, and you know that's how I considered it, and I considered all those things, and this is the conversations you should be having with a a good financial advisor is why I'm saying these things. Let's look at their income real quick. So Mr. Patriot is making $50,000 a year and he works at Wawa. And uh, I put Wawa because it just kind of seemed funny to me at the time. And it was the first thing that popped in my head. So, and you know, I wanted to put it in context of maybe he's a, a district manager there and that's what they make. I don't know. So Miss Patriot's going to get her E7 pension, which is just under $30,000 a year. And then she is going to go to school. And in three years later, she is going to be, you know, like Mr. Wawa, Patriot, uh, earn about $50,000 a year initially. This also tells us and provides what they're going to do. Um, if nothing else changes in their income between now and then, which it probably will, right? So we do this exercise again when it makes sense. But as things are today, going forward, this is what each of their Social Securities would be if they took it at uh, their uh, full retirement age or actually uh, at their early retirement age, maybe they need it to because uh, cash flow purposes, or they just want it to. You have lots of options with your social security too, as to when you do or don't take it. You get less if you take it earlier, you get more if you wait longer, it makes sense. And then they're also gonna have for three years, the $25,000 uh, for basic housing allowance, which could come in very handy um, in certain situations. Here's their expenses. Uh, currently they're living off about $84,000 a year. During retirement, they can get by off of uh, 72,000, which is more like six grand a year or six grand a month uh, net of taxes. And then uh, finally, when that guy finally passes on, I'll have five years to live free by myself uh, is what she's saying. And in that situation, she only needs about 5,000 net. But I will also say this too, right? It's a long time between now and then. When we look at those cash flow things, I didn't point this out on the last one, but $6,000 a year or a month now is not $6,000 a month next year or five years from now, or certainly not 30 years from now. So we incrementally increase that based on an inflation factor. And I think for this, we did two and a half percent, but that's also part of the discussion. If it gets that deep. Here's their liability payment. Um, we don't consider that in their personal cash flow. Uh, we look at that differently because we know someday that'll go away. It helps us to project their income needs later, but this is what they're paying for their mortgage uh, right now. Um, going forward until that's paid off. And I went in there and, and that's why they have equity because they paid it off for 10 years. But again, for brevity, we won't get into that layer of it. Um, here's her educational expense for her son. So Mr. and Mrs. Patriot, uh, their daughter will be 18 and 20, 30, 10 years from now. 
Uh, she intends to go to USF up the street because mom and dad want to keep a watchful eye on her, but she is going to live uh, on campus or in an apartment with some other friends. And so as opposed to He-Man's uh, college need of $22,000 a year because he's living with mom, you know, this goes up about $1,000 a month uh, living off campus and food and everything else. And then they have life insurance and then it calculates their 1040 return uh, like we talked about with the last case. So um, savings and contributions. So um, Mr. Patriot has been contributing and again, maybe this is why he's got more in his uh, qualified retirement account versus her TSP because he's been deferring 4% a year of his salary. Well, so, so is she, but hey, he's been getting 4% match dollar for dollar for the last you know, 10, 15 years working there. So that's why he's outperformed. And he's taken on a little bit more risk. He likes uh, stocks more than, than bonds and she likes safer stuff. Real quick here on the protection thing. We have uh, life insurance and Mr. Patriot has $400,000 uh, for his wife pay off the mortgage, have a little nest egg there. And she says, okay, well, um, you're going to keep working if something happens to me and, and we're going to give you enough to just pay off the mortgage and that'll lighten things up a little bit. Uh, whatever the situation is, we'll factor into it. So let's go to our plan. And very much like Jane, who's single and has a lesser income need, uh, their income need is more as we described. But when we look at their probability, it's very similar. And what good is financial planning if I just showed you everything is rosy? Man, I hope my life is this rosy. Well, maybe it will be. Maybe that's why you do this financial plan, to have that comfort of mind for the next year, two years, or the next 30 years, right? So they have an 89% probability of, of, of meeting their success. And typically, 85% or more is, is a good outcome. Uh, people can take actions uh, in advance if um, they are approaching or things start not looking so rosy and how their situation would be um, going forward into retirement. But if they needed to look more specifically as into the next few years, just like we did with Jane, then we have the ability to look at, just like a moment ago, as Zoom catches up, we'll look at her cash flow report, spend less time on it than before. Because I do want to change the assumption to show, hey, wow, now they're not in as advantageous a situation as they were just a minute ago when I showed you an 89% success rate. So here, you know, they're able to meet with their jobs and everything going on, their savings, they're able to meet, you know, ends meet. And then this big green arrow here, uh, that's when Mr. Patriot died and she got that $400,000 insurance. So that helped her out a little bit. So here's their income each year, it's increasing based on uh, she went to work right after a few years and then they're getting modest raises and we can go into all the different layers here. Uh, but again, I just wanted to show you and I'm gonna get short on time here real quick. So um, I won't get into it too much. We can always have those discussions aside. Are you just knowing that, you know, the ability to hone in on a year's cash flow or the next two years because you're really concerned about how life has thrown a unexpected event such as the last you know three months and going forward we don't know uh, we can certainly project and run parallel scenarios well what if I go to work in six months okay good we'll be okay I only need to take this much out of my savings or what if I have to wait two years and oh what's that going to do to my savings account well, we can factor in and look at those things here's where the income is coming from all right pension it's always going to be there and then we have uh, social security has started earlier now they're both getting social security they're both out of the workforce. That's why you only got Social Security and pension. Now we can look at every single year uh, where our income sources are coming from and how much I'm making at Wawa. All right. So real quick, let's just go and show how a minor change in income can affect everything. And that's where you might need to do a financial plan scenario because life did just throw you a big change and that might affect you now and going forward. And so I just wanted to change the income of Mr. Patriot. So maybe he wasn't a good district manager. He's not wow, wow, corporate material. So what we have to do here is change his income. And what I'm gonna do is come in here and I'm gonna say, you know what? You're just not corporate material. You're gonna be making $36,000 a year going forward. 
hopefully you'll buy a lottery ticket and you can come back to your financial planner and have a conversation about that. But if he took a big nosedive in income, if you're projecting you take a nosedive in income, maybe it's just temporarily, right? Maybe because of all this, they put him on part-time employment. Maybe it's because, maybe it wasn't because he was a, a, a bad district manager. But if nothing else changed as we see it today, look at how much his probability changes for the whole family. Oh, wow. So you're telling me that I only have a 42% chance of maintaining that lifestyle that I wanted to in retirement. Well, yeah, because now you're making a lot less. You're not contributing as much to your 401k. Your social security is less now. And then I'll just run it one more time um, with maybe $45,000 a year. But all these things and the critical takeaway is they all affect us. And, and if you need clarity in your life, that was the point of doing this exercise. And so just real quick again, if we can show what his income was, we're going to modify it one more time. Because if he's not making more income, then, then what is he going to have to do? He's going to have to spend less or he's going to have to work longer. Or like I said, win the lottery. And the only other option would be a combination of all those things. Well, maybe he just started working less and spending more time with his you know, child before she goes off to college and um, affected his income. And as far as we know, that's not going to change until they want to hire him back for more time. So now we're looking at a situation where the Patriots long-term financial plan All right, now they have a 75% chance. You know, that, that's okay, really. We'd have to have a more intimate discussion on maybe you work a couple more years, um, maybe you work on the weekends more or, or whatever, but you can hopefully get the, 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 the point of, of this exercise. So um, I am going to stop sharing all that. Uh, well, you know what, I'll pause for just a second. Katie, um, is there any questions uh, that might be in the chat right now to any of this? We don't have any questions that have come in from the Q&A or the chat, but if anyone okay. has any, go ahead and drop them in now and we can yeah. uh, get those answered. Yeah. And if I haven't, maybe, you know, some people are sleeping looking at all these numbers and things that um, I do. Uh, but relative to this exercise, again, we're talking in terms of now and later. Maybe it's just now you need to focus on, and a lot of people are doing that. A lot of some of the wealthiest clients that I represent at the bank, <laughs> believe it or not, you know, they're, they're having to make decisions for their businesses because it affects their employees and whether they are able to keep them employed and for how long. And, you know, th this applies to those types of things, too. So, um, you know, it's just a, a crazy time. Um, and uh, I'm here. There's other resources in your life. Know that these types of resources are out there. Look at e-money. A lot of financial institutions use it. Um, but uh, just because you have a piano doesn't mean you know how to play it, but don't shortchange yourself either. Um, if your financial advisor does not provide this type of level of planning for you, you, if you need it, then seek it out. Not everybody needs it, right? You might have sat through this whole thing, and if you learned one thing out of my discussion, then, then that's great. Or if there's a follow-up thing, certainly feel free. Katie, I don't know what the procedure would be to follow up if somebody needed to uh, ask a question on the side or didn't want to ask it in a group or for time's sake, but... Um, you know, I'm, I'm available uh, to answer a financial planning question or something that stemmed from, from our discussion today. Uh, and Katie, I'm going to turn it back over to you, but let me start by thanking each and every one of you for your service in a sometimes thankless uh, environment that we are in at this point. But um, you know, I've not, like many of you, made it a, a big part of my life, but it, it's been a very big part of my life, my military experience, even though it was only a few years I think I can give back to the military more now than, than maybe when I was in service. And I've done that in a couple different avenues. So hopefully some of this has been useful to you. And I wish you uh, success during this challenging time. And uh, uh, I'll be here for you if, if, if I can be. Thank you so much. Katie, do I need to turn this over to you? 
Yep, Chris is going to come back on. Oh, okay. Give it to Chris. And so I'm going to go to more. And where is it? All right. Thank you, Mike, for joining us this evening and sharing that important information with us. Our next speaker is Kent Harrow. Kent's familiar with the transition process as he transitioned three years ago after 31 years as a Navy SEAL. His last duty station was at US SOCOM and he currently works as the Vice President of Operations at Grow Financial Federal Credit Union, formerly MacDill Federal Credit Union. Kent is responsible for 25 branches in Florida and South Carolina. Kim will be speaking to us tonight about clear ex career exploration and the balance of finding passion and purpose in the next chapter of your career. Kent, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, sir. It's good to be here. Thanks for the kind introduction. Katie, thanks for setting this up. Uh, Kay, thanks for your sponsorship and loyalty to the organization. Much appreciated. Uh, Mike, thanks for the presentation. <clears throat> Always good to get refreshed on financial planning. Um, so yeah, I got, got out of the Navy three years ago and got out June 1st and started working at Grove Financial on June 7th. So I'm very familiar with the transition and I'm happy to be here. I wish we were together. Um, it's a lot easier to talk if you're getting a little bit of feedback, like, you know, you're boring people or you're not and that kind of thing. But obviously we can't do that. So this is the best we can do. Um, what I'm going to talk about, there is nothing magic about it. Um, I'm just going to tell you my story and a tool that I picked up that uh, was useful to me. And hopefully you'll take something away from it. Um, and I think I'll probably give you a little bit of time back tonight. So when I first, I, I, it, like Chris just said, you know, he, he mentioned the word passion and things like that. And when I saw that in something written to me, I said, uh oh, and so I did a Google search and a YouTube search of uh, job passion kind of stuff and found a lot of self-help videos and a lot of other things that I'm not qualified to really talk about. Um, so that's not what I'm here for. So throughout your transition, I'm sure just like uh, Kay mentioned when we first started, um, the hardest question you get asked is what do you want to do? So, so what do you want to do? Um, not many of us know what exactly we want to do. Um, some are lucky to. You know, there's those few that just know they want to be a government service civilian, and so they can roll right into that. Um, but the majority of, majority of us just kind of know that we want to do something that matters, and we want to contribute to something that matters to us. Um, and it's really hard to put your finger on it. Um, you have no idea what's really out there and you don't really understand or know what they really need. Um, you, hear, you hear things, you read things, you talk to people like me and I try to, to, to make you understand what I'm trying to say. Um, but really until you get out there and you see it, um, you really don't know exactly what it is they need and how you can, how you can fill that hole. Um, you probably lack a little bit of confidence just because you don't have the experience in the, in the arena. And so for me personally, you know, so what do you want to do? You know, I wanted to contribute and make a difference. And that's pretty much all I knew. Um, you've all seen Simon Sinek and his presentation on, on why. And that's been, that's been a bedrock of mine for a couple of years now, ever since I started the transition. But in uh, late 2015, so about two years before I retired, um, a friend of mine said, hey, why don't you call my buddy in California? He's a headhunter. He can help you out. So I call this guy and he says, okay, um, by behavior, what do you want to do? How do you want your day to go? And so I started working on this little homework assignment for him. And, you know, imagine a, most of y'all are probably too, too young to remember typewriters, but imagine, you know, somebody typing, I'm typing my report and then, it, ah, it's wrong. I rip it out and throw it away. Um, did that like 97 times. Finally, I started kind of just doodling, you know, which I do all the time anyway. And as I doodled, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that works. You know, put another thing on there. Yeah, that works. And I finished a picture and I'll show that to you later. But uh, it turned out that it really kind of framed my why and kind of shaped the environment that I wanted to be in. 
And so it gave me a metric to kind of measure, you know, to compare things I was talking to, people I was talking to, businesses, different organizations to my picture to see, okay, does that fit or doesn't it? And so I turned it into the guy and uh, he said, you know, he was a little bit taken aback and he's like, hey, this is the first picture I've ever gotten. So I don't know what he normally gets. I don't know how people write whatever it is they write, but he gets written things most of the time. But uh, he told me to use it, to adjust it as necessary, and to don't ever give up on that being my day-to-day, -day, by behavior, what I wanted. So I took his, his, his advice, and so this isn't, this isn't a very, this isn't anything to be excited about, but this is my picture, and it hasn't changed at all. <clears throat> um, I kind of just started in the top left corner and this is in no priority order whatsoever. Um, I just kind of started going with, you know, what I was thinking about at the time. And it was just a stream of consciousness exercise for me. Um, however you decide to do this or go through this exercise or even think about it, you know, whatever works for you is great. So, you know, for me, I like the, you know, I draw comfort from having a mission statement that I understand. I understand what the commander's guidance is. Um, there's something that we do that's measurable, re repeatable, sustainable. And there's, you know, already kind of, you know, groundwork of policy procedures, SOPs, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was really hoping for a career with relationships, both up and out, down and in, frequent relationship, relational uh, instances with customers and, you know, fellow employees. Um, and the results, that's another area that I kind of cared about a lot. Um, something that we do makes a, a lasting, you know, provides a lasting result. And then that result is positive for the community and the environment. Um, there's a personal impact and a health impact. And as you go around this thing, it just, it, like I said, it's just a stream of consciousness. What, what matters to me? The characteristics of and the things in and around the environment, um, kind of having fun with that. I will tell you that Grow Financial does not have a music room, but they have everything else. So it was, uh, that was a good match for me. Um, it was important to me that I knew all the people that I worked with and I understood what made them tick. So that would make me feel you know, more of a, more of a team, team environment is what I was looking for, where they were actually polite and considerate people. So the one failure I've had is useful meetings. I'm not sure any, any industry in the world lets you not have meetings. So that one kind of is a big, big strikeout, but we, I still try to minimize them as much as I can. And then most of my time spent listening, guiding, coaching, and encouraging. That's, you know, that's where, you know, that's where a lot of our experience already, already exists. So when you get in the corporate environment and you're able to do that, it's really, you know, comforting and something that I enjoy doing. Um, wanted the life work balance. I wanted to be surrounded by gratitude and servant leaders and I wanted the right money. So that was my picture that kind of framed as I, as I started my, you know, various uh, explorations to see where I was going to end up. Um, everything on here, you know, it, it never changed. And it's actually, I'm quite happy with it. It's exactly what makes me want to get up in the morning and go do what I do because this is what I do. So it's kind of, you know, not that I designed it or anything. I didn't design my, you know, where I'm at now. But at least I put a framework around it that I could kind of compare compare my current situation with to understand whether or not I, I was happy doing what I'm doing or not. So um, I will turn this off. There we go. So the, uh, you know, each one of your stories is unique. Um, my path that I got, that I took to get to where I am is probably not repeatable just because a bunch of weird circumstances happened that ended up getting me where I am. But 
it's important for you guys to think about what it is you want to do. What is that? You know, and you're not going to know what that is, but you need to at least be able to identify what you care about in the environment, what you care about in the organization. How are you going to feel doing that day in and day out in that environment with those people, the way they act, um, what they care about, you know, all that stuff adds up to, you know, command climate. And so you want to go somewhere that fits your, your dream of what a good command climate is. So as you transition, I urge you to work at it, treat it like it's a mission. Um, do, your, do your homework, do your work to try and at least, you know, at a minimum, you got to figure out, figure out yourself. So most of us don't spend any time really doing that while you're in active duty. But as you transition, you got to kind of, kind of reach in there and figure that out and then keep the faith that it's going to work out because it, it will, especially if you keep your focus on what you want and what you need and what you think the environment ought to look like for you. So in just uh, words of encouragement, I, I don't know what anybody's looking to do, um, but corporate America wants and needs you and the skill set you bring. So you have to translate what you've done for them so that they understand how that how what you spent the last X number of years doing applies to what they're doing and how you could fit in and be the solution to what they what problems they have. Um, everybody that at any organization, when they hear you're from the military, they're gonna form an opinion and it's based on their past experiences and what they see on TV and the media. And as long as you show up and you're not a jerk, um, you're going you're gonna to establish your own framework that they start viewing military folks by. So uh, as you go to these corporations and you begin doing interviews and things like that, your job is to show them why you are the answer to their problems. So everybody has a problem and everybody's looking for a solution and you guys have the skill sets that they need in their organization to create the organization that they want. And if you've gone to the, through the effort of drawing your own picture or figuring out your why, there's lots of good exercises out there about how to figure out what your why is. That's a little bit of a deeper thing. This is more just the environment. There's, you know, this is stuff that's easy to just like look at a company and say, oh, okay, you know, that works, that works, that doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm, I'm, I apologize that you might get back to your family about an hour earlier than you expected. Um, but I'm happy to help in any way I can. I'm local here in Tampa. Um, I do a lot of work with different military organizations and it's an exciting time for you. Enjoy it and good luck. Mr. Chambers. Thank you, Ken. Uh, one second, let me get my video going here. All right. So, so thanks again, and uh, providing your insights and joining us this, this afternoon. Uh, very insightful, uh, good chat. So hopefully today has left you feeling better prepared to enter the Tampa Bay business community and reaffirmed your decision to transition from the military. Please reach out to Tampa Bay Chamber if we can be a resource during this process. Our next and final webinar will be on Tuesday, June 30th, and we hope you'll join us as we hear from Kashima Garcia from Quiet Professionals, who will talk about expectation management regarding corporate culture, attire, individual outlooks, and perceptions of the military. Registration is open on the Chamber's website. Thank you again to USAA for sponsoring today's event. We appreciate your commitment to military families and our programming. Thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon.